الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا أنا وزدنا علما يا رب العالمين. We begin with the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and by sending salutations upon the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and upon his family and his companions. And then I would like to start by thanking the brothers and indeed all of the volunteers and the, the brothers and sisters associated with the masjid who made such a big effort and subhanAllah, it really has been a huge effort. Uh, SubhanAllah, it's been very, very welcoming. And uh, it has been, uh, it has been a really amazing experience in reality uh, to see all of the effort that's been made into making this couple of days a success. With the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with his permission. And I would also like to thank all of you for making the effort to come here, taking your time out to come here and to listen, and indeed for all of your kind words and, and you know, subhanAllah, I've met some, uh, some very, very lovely brothers from the brothers who've come to listen to the talk, who've been telling me about their experiences and, uh, and about the masjid and about the efforts of the masjid. So, Jazakumullahu khayran wa barakallahu feekum. May Allah Azza wa Jal reward you all with good and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shower you all with his blessings. The topic today was the one that I chose. Uh, the brothers left uh, tonight's talk topic open to me. And for a long time, in my own personal situation, I have been worrying about this topic. And I figured that if I'm worrying about this topic, there are likely a lot of brothers and sisters who are also worrying about this topic. And that is how we find a balance between the many competing things in our lives. Our work, our children, our families, our religion, our personal worship, our worship that benefits others, so many many facets of our lives and especially when you are living in a country where most people are not dedicated either to da'wah or either to learning you don't find many people in the UK who are dedicated 24 hours to simply studying Islam nor do you find many people who are dedicated 24 hours to teaching Islam Rather, what you find is people who have a mix of things. It's not like things used to be when I was in Medina. When I was in Medina, things were easy. SubhanAllah, we felt they were so difficult, and in reality, they were so, so easy. Because we had only one thing to worry about. Some of us had two if we had family. But the vast majority of the students, they had one thing and one thing only to worry about. And that was their study, and that was the only thing that kept them busy. They didn't have to worry about work. They didn't have to worry about their family. They didn't have to worry about how they were going to pay their rent at the end of the month. They didn't have to worry about their children and what their children were doing. And they didn't have to worry about their own personal time. They simply had their study. And that is a very simple situation. But the reality is for most of us, certainly for me, and I presume for the majority of you, the situation is that we have a lot of things to balance between. In the deen and in the dunya. In the deen and in the dunya. A lot of us have families, extended families, wives, children, parents, relatives. We have personal commitments. We have personal projects that we want to see succeed. We have our Islamic responsibilities. How do we balance all of these things? And so I began to reflect upon this topic in the light of the Book of Allah, 
and the Sunnah of the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Every minute of your life to affairs that relate to the religion. And from this is the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, وَرَهْبَانِيَّةً إِبْتَدِعُوهَا مَا كَتَبْنَاهَا عَلَيْهِمْ and this monasticism, they became monks and they locked themselves in monasteries. They innovated it. They didn't, they weren't commanded. We didn't command them to do this. Allah said, talking about the Christians, there were some of them who locked themselves in monasteries. They did nothing but that. They refused to marry, they refused to you know, to, to do anything in that regard. They refused to have any connection to the dunya. They didn't mix with the people. And Allah says this is a monasticism, a form of being like a monk that they invented and they innovated. And Allah didn't ask them to do it. So Allah hasn't asked you to do that. And from this is the hadith of the Prophet wasallam regarding those three men. He said that I am going to pray all night and I'm not going to sleep. And the, the, the beginning of the hadith is that they went to some of the wives of the Prophet sallallahu and they asked them how the Prophet sallallahu used to be and then they made a mistake. They said we can, you know, this is his level. He has all of his sins forgiven. We have to do something more. And so one of them said, I'm going to pray all night and I'm not going to sleep. And one of them said, I'm going to fast every single day and I will never have a day that I don't fast. And one of them said, I'm going to abandon marriage. I'm going to become celibate. I'm not going to marry. And when the Prophet وسلم, heard of this, he became angry. And he said, فَمَنْ رَغِبَ عَنْ سُنَّتِي فَلَيْسَ مِنِّي The one who turns away from my sunnah is not one of me. And he mentioned that I go to sleep and I wake up and pray. And I have days when I fast and days when I don't fast. And I marry women, so the one who turns away from my sunnah is not one of me. It's not from me. So this explains to us the concept that we are commanded to find a balance. From the, from the beautiful ahadith and perhaps the most important of the ahadith in this regard is the hadith of Hanzala ibn Radi' al-Usaydi radiallahu anhu who said that Abu Bakr met me and he said to me, how are you, O Hanzala? And I replied to him, Hanzala has become a munafiq. Hanzala is a hypocrite. Nafaqa Hanzala. I've become a munafiq. What a huge statement to make. I've become a munafiq. You know, I'm no longer a Muslim. I'm a person who has nifaq. Abu Bakr said, Subhanallah, ma taqul. Glory be to Allah. Exalted is Allah. What are you saying? You've become a munafiq. What do you mean? Hamdala replied, when we are in the company of Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, He reminds us of the hellfire and paradise as though we are seeing them with our very eyes. And when we leave the company of Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we attend to our wives, to our children, to our business and most of the things that he tells us go out of our mind. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, the best of mankind after the prophets and the messengers. What did he say? He said, by Allah, I experienced the same thing that you do. That when we're in front of the messenger, it says, though paradise and hellfire are in front of us, we have nothing in our minds except to work for Jannah and to run from everything that leads to the hellfire. And then we go away from him and we have business to take care of, we have 
wives, have children, we have demands, we have needs, we have the dunya calling upon us, and we forget a lot about the feeling that we had when we were with him, and the aims and the efforts that we were making when we were with him, they go out of our mind. Hamdala radiallahu an said, so I and Abu Bakr radiallahu an went to Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said to him, O oh, Messenger of Allah, Hamdala has become a hypocrite. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Wamada, what's this all about? And notice the, the manners and notice the sabr of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That somebody comes and makes a statement like this, I've become a hypocrite. You know, Abu Bakr said, Subhanallah, what are you saying? The Prophet said, well, tell me, what's the problem? <coughs> Explain to me what's going on. He said, O Messenger of Allah, when we are in your company, you remind us of the hellfire and paradise as if we see them with our very eyes. But whenever we go away from you and attend to our wives and our children and our business, much of this goes out of our minds. The Prophet said, by the one who my soul is in his hand. If your state of mind remained the same as it was in my presence, and you were always busy with the remembrance of Allah, the angels would shake hands with you in your beds and on the roads. But O oh, Hanvala, there is a time for this and a time for that. <laughs> There's a time for this and a time for that. So the Prophet Sallallahu established for Hanbala that this is not hypocrisy. This is normal human life. You will not remain in a state where you are constantly engaged in dhikr and salah and siyam and all of the other good deeds and you don't have a moment where you think about the dunya. And you don't have a moment where you think about your business and you don't have a moment where you think about your children and your wives. If you remained like this, the angels would shake your hands in your beds and on your roads. And the Prophet is indicating this is not possible because the angels do not do this. They didn't do it to the companions. And don't be fooled by some people who come along later from the quote unquote the awliya, the pious, and they say, yes, I am in this state and the angels shake my hands. If they didn't do it to Abu Bakr radiallahu an, for sure they're not going to do it to you. You can take that to the bank. Subhanallah. Walakin sa'atun wa sa'ah. Sa'atun wa sa'ah. There's a time for this and there's a time for that. Every single thing has its time and every single thing has its place. And from this hadith we benefit. That if you were to do the wrong thing at the wrong time, this would be blameworthy. But as long as you apply the right thing at the right time, you'll be fine. So it's not a matter of us turning away from the dunya like the monks. Not like the monks who lock themselves in the monasteries. Allah didn't ask them to do it, they invented it. Nor are we in such a state of ibadah that we fast every day of the year and we don't have a day when we break our fast. Or that we pray every hour of the night and we don't get any sleep. Or that we refuse to marry women and we refuse to enjoy ourselves in a small part of permissible enjoyment that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. But everything has its time. And the problem is, and this is really the, the, the essence of the matter, the core of the matter. The problem is when there is a lack of distinction between those times or when the times are used inappropriately. So the wrong time, the time for prayer comes and the person is engaged in the enjoyment of the worldly life. This is a problem. The time for the remembrance of Allah comes, but the person is busy with their business. This is a problem. But as for giving your business a time, giving your worship a time, this is what the Prophet ﷺ instructed you to do. And just talking on the topic of business and earning a living, 
from the greatest things that you can do is to be self-sufficient. And I don't mean self-sufficient from Allah Azza wa Jal. Because nobody is self-sufficient from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is a summit. The one who everybody is in need of him and he is in need of no one. But self-sufficient from the people. <clears throat> that you don't have to hold out your hand and say, give me, give me. And this is from the highest levels of Tawheed and the highest levels of Iman. That you don't stretch out your hands to people all the time. You have a, a, a profession, an occupation, even if it's something small, even if it's something simple, even if you're a cobbler and you mend shoes, you have something that you earn your risk that is given to you by Allah so that you don't have to walk around with your hand out in front of the people. Because this lowers your iman and it lowers your tawheed and it lowers your trust in Allah Azza wa Jal. The Prophet Sallallahu mentioned that if you trusted upon Allah or you relied upon Allah with true reliance, he would provide for you like he provides for the bird. It leaves the house, it leaves the nest with its stomach empty and it returns with its stomach full. So there is a benefit in this, in your deen. Don't think that these matters of dunya, and this is a misconception, that these matters of the dunya are matters that have no benefit for you in your deen. If you use the dunya properly, it can serve you in your religion. In a huge way in your self-sufficiency, in your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in your uh, being able to survive without needing to ask the people, in spreading the good amongst the people, in being able to give charity, and in, in having children, having many children and bringing them up as good Muslims. These are areas that serve you in your religion. They are a part of your deen, even though they're associated with the dunya. The problem is that like we hear in the hadith of Hanzala, every single thing has a time and a place. And so what we want to identify today are all of the different things that we have to worry about and where their time and place is and how we find a balance between them. The second hadith that I want to talk to you about is the hadith of Salman al-Farisi radiallahu anhu. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made a bond of brotherhood between Salman and Abu Darda. And Salman paid a visit to Abu Darda and he found Umm Darda in a shabby state. So he found the wife of Abu Darda in a shabby state. This was before the revelation of the hijab. Lest some people come with Ladina fi qulubihim marad people who have a sickness in their hearts and they say this is an evidence for free mixing and an evidence for subhanallah this was revealed before the ayat of the hijab that Abu Darda and Umm Darda and Salman came to the house of Abu Darda and he was made to be like his brother and he found Umm Darda in a shabby state she wasn't taking care of herself she looked like she didn't she didn't really care about you know, the way she was presenting herself for her husband. He said to her, what is the reason for this? She said, your brother Abu Darda is not interested in the luxuries of this world. He doesn't want anything from me. He doesn't look at me, he's not interested. So I'm not making an act. In the meantime, Abu Darda came radiallahu anh, and he prepared a meal for Salman radiallahu anh. Salman said to Abu Darda, Eat. Eat with me. Abu Darda said, I'm fasting. Salman said, I'm not going to eat unless you eat. And this was not an obligatory fast. Obviously, this is a, a voluntary fast. So he said, look, unless you eat with me, I'm not going to eat. So Abu Darda broke his fast and ate with him. When the night came, in the very beginning of the night, Abu Darda got up to offer the night prayer. But Salman told him to sleep and so he slept then he got up again and Salman again said to him sleep when it was the last hours of the night Salman said to him now get up and pray and both of them offered the prayer then Salman turned to Abu Darda anhu, and he said your Lord has a right over you and yourself has a right over you and your family has a right over you, so give all of those who have a right over you their right. 
Then Abu Darda radiallahu anhu, as it was the custom of the companions to do, he went straight to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, O Messenger of Allah, Salman has said this to me and he narrated the whole story. He told me not to pray until the end of the night. He told me not to fast all the time. He told me to give my family their right. He said, everyone that has the right over me, I should give them their right. So he told the whole story. The Prophet sallallahu said, Sadaqa Salman. Salman has told the truth. And this is a sunnah now of the Prophet Sunnah taqririya. It's a sunnah. The Prophet ﷺ is approving of everything that Salman said. <laughs> Every single one of these things have a right over you. Your family have a right over you. Before them, Allah Azza wa Jal has a right over you. How evil would it be? And this is what we see from the atheists today. What do we see from the atheists? That they give the rights to their family. And they give the rights to humanity. And they're the kindest and most generous people to the people. But they completely ignore and deny the right of Allah Azza wa Jal, the one who gave them everything that they have. So this is no good. Your Lord has a right over you. And yourself, your nafs, your body, your own self has a right over you. Your health, maintaining your body, maintaining your health, maintaining, you know, your your gift that Allah Azza wa Jalla has given you, this has a right over you. And your family has a right over you. And then he didn't stop there. He said, so everyone who has a right, because the rights are more than these three. These are three examples, or three of the most important. But there are more than this. So everyone who has a right over you, give them their right. And so in the light of these ahadith, we want to go back and to look at the different areas of our lives and try to understand the different competing rights or competing times and activities that exist that are pulling our attention between the deen and the dunya and try to understand how we can get the most out of all of this. And as we said, that you shouldn't think of the, the worldly life as being something that is disconnected from the religion. This is the view of secularism, that there is a separation between religion and between everything else that you do. In Islam, everything is Islam. And you have an opportunity to turn your work into a reward in the sight of Allah and we'll talk about this in a moment. So I started by thinking the different areas from the hadith of Salman, from the hadith of Hanbala, from personal experience, what are the different competing areas? And this, this works for me, and I think it's probably true for many people. And you can, you, know, you can adapt it according to what is true for you. So the first thing I began to think about is the matter of personal worship. What do I mean by personal worship, and why do I distinguish between personal worship and other forms of worship? Worship covers many things. Shaykh al-Islam wa Taymiyyah, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, Ismun jami'u li kulli ma yuhibbuhu Allah wa yardah min al-aqwali wal-a'man al-zahira wal-batina. That worship is a comprehensive term for everything that Allah loves and is pleased with, whether statement or action, inward or outward. That's a lot of things. And so if we just simply said worship, I mean, you know, the food you put in your family's mouth is worship. And you're taking care of your children is worship. But I wanted to separate it into personal worship. So by personal worship, I mean those acts of worship that are personal to you. They don't affect anybody else. We call them ibadat ghayru muta'addiya. They don't go to other people or they don't affect other people. They ibadat that belong to you, like your prayer, your fasting, your dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your general sort of personal acts, you know, your voluntary fasts, your voluntary prayers, your getting up for the night prayer, those things that are between you and between Allah, and they don't have an effect on other people. And the second area, those ibadat that are ibadat muta'addiyah. They're ibadat, but they benefit others. Like teaching people beneficial knowledge, like 
giving charity, like helping others out, like volunteering at your local <clears throat> masjid. This is ibadah, it's worship. But it's worship that is there to benefit you and to benefit others. And I've also separated one category, which is the category of studying Islam. And studying Islam in reality comes into both. Why? Because when you study Islam, what is your intention? Your intention is the hadith of the waft of Abdul Qais. They came to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they said, O Messenger of Allah, to the words of this effect, we are only able to come to you in the sacred months. Between us and you are the tribe of Mudar and the fighting is severe between us and we can only come to you in the sacred months. So teach us something that we can go and inform others about and we can enter into Jannah by it. And Al-Imam Ahmed, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he mentioned that this is the perfect example of intention. The perfect example of intention is the intention of studying to benefit yourself and to benefit others. So studying is not something you do only to benefit others. You want to get the benefit in yourself, in your personal ibadat, and in your ibadat towards for the benefit of yourself and for the benefit of others.